we'll figure out who we can blame on our tardiness later. It'll be a source of discussion. It's good to have everyone here this morning. We will, of course, um, we had one or two options. Um, have David give us the cliff note versions and have him preach, teach for 15 minutes or go our normal class time, and we're going to do that. So um, the alarm's going off. Um, so what we're going to do here in just a moment, Brother Banning will begin our gospel meeting with the Bible class this morning. And um, I have known of Brother David for a number of years. I don't know if we have met before. I'm rememberable, so he would remember that. Um, but he does, a, he does a wonderful job. He works with the Dowling Road Congregation. If you remember back 2013, Max Dawson held our summer gospel meeting. And David works with Max there, or, well, Max is not retired, but uh, works with the congregation there. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to have uh, Dale to direct our minds in word of prayer, and then we'll turn the class over to David. Shall we pray? Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for this Lord's Day, for this privilege we have of being able to assemble together to be an encouragement to each other for the beginning of our gospel meeting and we pray that there would be much fruit positive fruit as a result of this gospel meeting that uh, we would grow spiritually and with that spiritual growth would be numerical growth we're thankful for david and his wife for their willingness to come and be with us for the safe journey that they've had looking forward to the time that we can be with them for this week and we pray, Father, that the uh, lessons that he has prepared would be lessons that would be much needed in this congregation for our spiritual growth. We're thankful, Father, for our visitors, for the encouragement that they bring to us, and we pray that we might be an encouragement to them as well. And we ask, Father, that you'd be with us, that we might always be safe, that we would always give you the praise and the glory, and that we would never do anything and bring any shame or reproach upon the earth, upon the church. And we ask, Father, that you'd give us opportunities that we might reach out and help those who are physically unable due to age and poor health, those who might have physical sickness, and that we might reach out and be able to help those who have not accepted you as their Savior as of yet. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. So Acts 9 and verse 31 reads, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. That optimistic assessment of the work of these early disciples could not have stood in greater contrast to an experience I had not longer after I moved to Chicago in 1990 and began working with a congregation there, I was invited to go up closer into the city and to work with one of the groups there on, on an event like this for a week. And I have to tell you, as a young preacher who was still just trying to figure this thing out, that week with that little church was very impressionable for me. The church gathered in a large facility, which was unusual for that part of the country. Churches in the upper Midwest tend to be small, in most cases, very small. I think this building would accommodate two or 300 people, so that was unusual. And during the time that I was there, the members shared with me that in years gone by, that they had filled that place up to overflowing. They talked about some of the notable preachers who'd come and how they'd had to put chairs out in the aisle and things like that. There wasn't any of that the week that I was there. And maybe that had something to do with the kid who was doing the preaching. But, but the truth is, there just weren't that many people there anymore. In fact, there were only a dozen or so, and they all sat on two pews right here in this big, empty auditorium. Have you ever seen that kind of thing? I got there early one evening, and... The only other person there was the guy who opened up the building. And so he let me come in, and I kind of wandered around. I'm a little nosy, I guess. And there was a long hallway that went back into their classroom wing. And so 
and just kind of walk back there and look around and imagine that in years gone by, they must have had all kinds of little kids classes like you've got going on this morning in all these different rooms. But you could tell there were no more little kids classes going on. The rooms just had a bunch of junk in them that had been, I guess, thrown aside. You didn't want to throw it out, and they'd just been sitting in there collecting dust. There weren't any children's classes because there weren't any children. This group that sat down front on these first two pews were almost exclusively older people. What had happened is over the years, this congregation, this once large thriving group had experienced a dramatic decline. And now they were at the point where they just had this handful of people trying to keep the doors open. And candidly, brothers and sisters, I am not optimistic about their ability to do that. That's kind of a sad story, isn't it? What I need you to understand with me this morning is that it is not an unusual story. But in fact, more and more is becoming characteristics of congregations of our people. So I get out about eight or nine weeks over the course of the year, get a chance to visit different places, do events for churches like what we're doing together this week, or just visit places on vacation. You guys do that too, right? When you travel, you get to visit other congregations. And I will tell you that, that finding churches in some state of decline is not an unusual thing, is it? In fact, for me, it is kind of the rare exception to encounter a group that seems to be thriving and doing well and sort of fit that description of what we read in Acts 9 and verse 31. Some churches kind of seem to be holding their own, but frankly, most of the churches that I encounter are at some place in this process of decline. And what I mean by that is, if you could go back 20 or 30 or 40 years, what you find is decade after decade, the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And when I say things like that, sometimes people say, David, it isn't all about the numbers, right? Except, folks, when the numbers get to zero, suddenly it's about the numbers, right? Who's going to open up the building and let everybody in? Those who study church growth in a more formal way than just my experience as traveling tell us that it is epidemic, that it is happening all over the country, and not just among our brethren, that churches are declining. What I'm wondering is why is that happening? Why are churches declining? I know that probably isn't the most optimistic way to begin a gospel meeting, but my intent is not to be negative this morning. I think we need to know the answer to this question. If this is happening, and I'm not exaggerating to suggest that it is epidemic, if that's true, we need to know about that, don't we? We can't afford to be like the ostrich who buries his head in the sand and pretend like a problem doesn't exist. What I want to know is what's going on in other places and why is it that over decades thriving churches just decline and decline and decline until they can't keep the doors open anymore? Because i got to tell you, in that part of the country, in our part of the country, that's happening. Churches closing up the doors because they just literally can't keep them open anymore. And what I want to do is I want to know why it's happening. So that on my watch, while I'm one of God's people working in this time with a church family, I want to be sure that we do all that we can to see what the problem is and to do something about it. And so that's really where I want to focus our attention this morning, not so much on why it's happening, but to understand why so that we know what to do. And so that's where we're headed this morning. We want to talk about why churches decline, but we want to talk about that in order that we can figure out some things we can do to prevent that from happening where we labor with the Lord. Before I jump into that, can I just tell you, it's been a really interesting morning. Um, it's really great to be with you all. My wife and I both really enjoyed the potluck yesterday, so we didn't walk into a room of strangers, and we got a chance to get acquainted with you. That was all nice. I am not responsible for this weather. I did not pray that God would send a storm, so we'd have a great visual illustration for the week. But I am excited about what we're going to be talking about this week. I have spent most of my life somewhere along the Gulf Coast. 
And so, because that's been my life, over time, I've learned something about storms. I've learned that I like hurricanes way better than tornadoes, which you guys know about, right? I like hurricanes way better than tornadoes, because tornadoes just have this awful habit of just dropping out of the sky all of a sudden. Isn't that so? I saw all the amazing array of Doppler radar out on the west side of your town yesterday, and it doesn't help that much, does it? You get a little bit of a heads, heads up, but tornadoes have this nasty way of just showing up suddenly. I'm going to tell you, folks, hurricanes are not like that. When there's a little blip on the radar out in the Atlantic Ocean in southeast Texas, we are watching. It's sometimes a month that we're watching that storm slowly make its way, and when it gets into the Gulf, we all pay attention. We usually know a hurricane is headed our way like a week before, certainly four or five days. And so we have an advantage you tornado folks don't have. We can batten down the hatches, get all the stuff out of the yard, and have an evacuation route, fill the car up, get money for, 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 for whatever we're going to need. And we can even get on the road three days in advance. That's what we do during hurricanes. I like being ready for the storm, don't you? And so what I'd like to suggest is that as God's people, there are storms coming. And with his book to guide us, he's helped us to prepare for the storms. And so that's really my purpose this week, is to ask you to think with me about some of the storms that we will face and what God leads us to do about them. And if along the way it can prep us a little bit and help us endure the storm better, well, then our purpose will have been met this week. And so I want to begin here with the storm of decline that is afflicting churches all around us. We need to anticipate that dreadful possibility that that could happen where we are and figure out, well, what are we going to do about it? So, let me give you three reasons churches decline. Number one, churches decline because they do not teach lost people. Will you mark that down somewhere? Churches decline because they do not teach lost people. I mentioned that because with this point, we are bumping up against an important reality with which we cannot afford to quibble. If we are not out as individual disciples in our communities, connecting with the people around us who are lost, having conversations about Christ, persuading those people to come and visit or to sit down at the kitchen table for a Bible study, teaching the gospel and helping those people become Christians. If that kind of work is not going on in our church family all the time, then the clock has started, brothers and sisters, and the time is going to come when we will decline and die. That is an unavoidable reality that every disciple needs to warmly embrace. And I will tell you why I'm so concerned about that. We can avoid facing that reality for a while. Let me explain what I mean by that. You may find yourself in a part of the country that is economically prosperous. And because there are good jobs there, what happens is it brings people from other places in the world into your community. And in that crowd that comes looking for the jobs, inevitably there will be some Christians in that crowd. And so where I live, we make gasoline. Doesn't do a whole lot for the way the air smells when you get up in the morning, but when gas prices are high, that is good in Southeast Texas. I'm sorry for the rest of you. We celebrate high gas prices. That helps us out. That means our economy is booming. And at Dallin Road where I preach, that brings people to us, people who are sent, because they never choose to come to Beaumont, sent to Beaumont to work. And listen, that fills up our congregation. Our numbers go up. And some of those families bring little kids and they filter into our Bible classes and the Bible class gets bigger and bigger. You ever had, uh, you know, that situation where like 20 kids in a two-year-old class, God bless the poor teacher's got to go in there. You know, those kind of problems begin to happen. And as the numbers go up, a lot of activity gets invested in that. There are people who are working on Bible classes and then you collect all those people in the auditorium and when they sing, the roof kind of raises off the foundations a little bit. And, and when that happens, what you will hear people say is, we are, really, we are really growing here, right? We're going to come back to that in a minute. What I want you to appreciate with me is all that kind of thing could be happening while we're not really growing at all, while we're neglecting what I believe is the fundamental mission of disciples in their time. 
In fact, what's interesting is Jesus announced this through the prophet Isaiah all the way back in Isaiah chapter 12. It's fascinating to me that as they're looking forward to the time of the Messiah, one of the things that we're told about the people who would celebrate and embrace this salvation is that they will make it known among the nations. They will share his deeds to the people. All the way back in the prophets, it said that we're going to go share this with everybody. And then you get to the New Testament, and the Lord says in Mark 16 and verse 15, go preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, verse 19, go make disciples of all the nations. And brothers and sisters, those early Christians believed that was their purpose. Because even after they killed Stephen in Acts 8, verse 4 says, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, right? It is a characteristic, one of the foundational characteristics of New Testament Christianity. It is evangelistic. And what I want to say to you is that our numbers can be growing up and our worship can be passionate, passionate and our, our, our efforts can be zealous and enthusiastic all the while we're neglecting the mission. Here's the problem with that. Churches that live by the economy die by the economy. So in the 1980s, any of y'all old enough to remember what happened to gas prices in the 1980s? They plummeted. That was really bad for us. In the 80s, the church where I preach lost 100 people to the economic downturn. And so when the economy goes away, so do the people. Jobs take them to other cities, and they take their children with them. And if that's where our growth has been coming, on, coming from, what happens to our numbers? Do you see it? Then they begin to go down and down and down. And suddenly we're having to group kids together in the Bible class because there's not enough to have sort of a whole class. And the singing isn't allowed. And it continues and continues. And someone begins to say, something's going wrong in this place. The church is declining. If you live by the economy, you die by the economy. Listen, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It is a blessing to have people from other places come join your efforts, isn't it? In fact, if you ever show up on a Sunday in Beaumont, Texas, God bless you. I'm hoping you're there for a job interview. I love having folks from other places come and join us. I just need you to understand, brothers and sisters, that is not growth of the kingdom. That's moving sheep around. Growth of the kingdom is the way Luke described it in Acts 2 and verse 47, where he said that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who got transferred. No, right? The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's kingdom growth. And brothers and sisters, it is the lifeblood of the church when our growth is based on on our evangelistic efforts, doesn't matter what the economy does. The church thrives because the lost are being reached. So, churches decline because they do not teach the lost. If we're to avoid that problem, then what we're going to have to do, I'm pushing the button and nothing's happening. There it is. We're going to have to get busy spreading the gospel. I told you I want to go a positive direction with this, right? And that's the thing that I want to emphasize. We're going to have to get busy spreading the gospels. We're going to have to constantly stoke that evangelistic fires. And so those of us who preach, we've got to preach about this all the time. I don't think a month of Sunday should go by without it finding its way somewhere into our teaching so that evangelism becomes church culture. I had someone come to me one time back home and say, you guys preach entirely too much about evangelism here. And I wanted to say, I didn't say, it's one of those things you think about saying, you don't say it. I thought, dude, you're in the wrong church because you're going to hear about that all the time. We're going to talk about that here. We need classes that equip people to reach folks today because these are not the lost people we were encountering 20 years ago. Man, when I talked to a lost person 20 years ago, I could grab my Bible and I could start talking about what God said. When I talk to lost people today, I'm having to begin with, can we be sure there is a God? It is a different culture that requires a different approach and we need to equip ourselves to be able to talk to people like that. Bring in some guys who are really good at this, who are doing this work in other places and say, come and tell us what you're doing and stir us up about it. As a church family, it ought to be the thing that we're concerned about in this time, reaching lost people. But I need to emphasize, 
because this is critical. Teaching the lost, evangelism, is not primarily a work of the church. There are things we can do collectively to, to help with the effort, but primarily, brothers and sisters, evangelism is an individual work. That's why two or three decades ago, you heard preachers talking about personal evangelism. That's what it is. And if churches are going to thrive, it's got to be personal. It's me, it's you going out in our circle of people that we influence and scattering some seed out there, talking about Jesus, trying to find out who's interested, who would accept an invitation, who could I have a Bible study with. It's you and me doing our thing out in our circle of friends. Because candidly, if we don't do that, and we don't reach lost people, brothers and sisters, the clock has started. And we will decline. And we will die. You know why I said this one first? Because it comes first. It's the most important thing. Churches that will thrive in the decades to come are churches that are consumed with the work of reaching lost people. I've got to move on, right? All right, second thing I want you to think about, because this is a really big deal to me too. Second thing we do to appreciate is that churches decline because they lose their kids. I get off on a tangent and I go on and on. I'm sorry about that. Can I tell you why I put this on the slide? I go visit these churches that have clearly declined over the years, big empty auditoriums, not a lot of people, and inevitably at some point while I'm visiting with that group, somebody will say something like this, and I bet some of you have heard this before. Someone will say, you know, if we just had half the kids that grew up here, this building would be full. Y'all have heard someone say that? Which, when I say that, my mind says, where'd the kids go? And I think there's a lot of way to answer that. Sometimes our kids graduate, and they go off to school. Do your kids do that? They go off to College Station or Austin, where we are. And the worst thing is, sometimes they go off, and they don't ever come back. Our girls meet some punk boy that they fall in love with, and he moves them off to Dallas, and they're gone forever from us. And that happens to us. Some just... Go over to Houston where the job market's a little better and find work there and things like that. That's what happens to some of our kids. But we all know sitting in this room, that's not what happens to all of our kids. That's not even the answer for most of them, right? The truth is churches lose their kids because they grow up and they graduate and they leave home and they leave the Lord. I don't know what the number is. There have not been any formal studies done among our brethren. I will tell you that in the broader religious world generally, the loss of kids is dramatic. It's freaking out churches today, just to be honest with you. In the average denomination, kids who grew up in a youth group, somewhere north of 70, 75% of those kids, three out of four, by the time they're 25, will not be worshiping anywhere. I don't know that our numbers are that high, but they're not much better than that, 60, 70%. So think about a church. Think about your church family and the time coming where half of them, more than half of them, three-quarters of them, leave home and leave Jesus. It's happening everywhere. So a second thing that I want to add is if you want to talk about the problem of decline, think about happens when one we're not reaching anybody new in the community and then on top of that our young people that are growing up here 60 70 80 percent of them leave the Lord and now what have you done you've dramatically accelerated the problem of decline do you see that and when that happens over over a successive series of generations then you see why churches begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller so a second thing I would add to my list is we need to make sure, folks, that we take care of our kids. I mean, just among our very highest priorities needs to be taking care of kids. Let me frame it up another way. These young people sitting down here are the most at-risk group statistically in this church family. You realize that? If you are over the age of 30 this morning and you are still serving God, you need to feel really good about that because it is a statistically high probability that you're going to finish the journey. Once you get past 30 and you're still serving God, most people serve Him all the way to the end after that, right? 
But you take 30 and you start working down, and what you're talking about is half or 60 or 70% will not, will not do that. So what do we say? It's the people in our church family we are most likely to lose. And so that needs to sit all, send us, set off all kinds of alarm bells to us. Waving red flags saying, we need to be concerned about these people. We need to take care of our young people. It needs to be among church's highest priorities. And so what does that look like? Let me quantify that just a bit. I think the churches need to have rock-solid Bible classes for their children. Bible classes that serve to solidify this spiritual foundation that mom and dad have been laying at home. I'll say more about mom and dad in a minute, okay? But our kids are growing up at a time, I'll talk about this in the next hour, when their faith is being attacked more than ever before. We need to, we need to be working on that with them, helping them build a strong faith in the Lord. Secondly, we need to be equipping our kids to serve in the kingdom. Everybody has a way to serve. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. God's given each one a special gift, and his charges employ it in serving one another as, the good, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So here we are. Every kid has a, a, a gift, a capacity somewhere that they are able to serve in the kingdom. I think one of our jobs is to help them figure out what that is. Our motto with our kids back home, three words, equipped to serve. When they've grown up in our church family, we want them to have figured out what they can do for God and to have honed that skill and developed that skill and started using it so that when they, when they move up to Oklahoma to go to the University of Oklahoma, our kids don't do that, but if they would, <laughs> they could jump right in here and go to work in this church family. When they graduate, we fuss at them. We said, don't you go someplace to sit on the back pew? You've got skills. You need to get to work wherever church you go and use them. We need to be preparing our kids to do things like that. And there are lots of things that you can do that go along with that. Gather them on a Sunday night once a month. Have a special devotion for them. Once a year, we have a special event on a weekend. It's in about two weeks just for, just for our young people to help them there with their challenges. Once a month, we sit them all down front. We have a kids' night lesson just for them to talk about the things that they're going through. All kinds of little things that church families can do to help take care of this special group. But now I need to tell you that that isn't the primary answer to this. Because you don't win, I usually say you don't win kids within the four walls of this church building. That does not work in this auditorium. But you know what I mean, right? Churches can supplement and do a little bit, but primarily this thing with our kids, it's won or lost at home. And so can I turn you to an Old Testament passage? Every parent needs to have this one marked in their Bible. I just think it is, it is compelling. It's in Deuteronomy 6. As Moses is preparing Israel to go into the promised land. And he's concerned about their future faithfulness. I won't read the whole chapter, but he talks about that in the first three verses. But here's his instruction. Here's what I want to emphasize in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. So mom and dad need to have things secured spiritually, if they're going to be able, verse 7, to teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your foreheads and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You see that? That's, that's where kids are one, folks at home with a mom and dad whose faith is strong and as a piece of that they're regularly teaching their kids about this and not just teaching about it all day long whether they're getting up in the morning and sitting around the breakfast table or going to bed at night or just hanging out around the house or out somewhere together all the time they're coming back to this covenant that we made with God what the terms of it are and how they're supposed to keep it this is where this is where our kids are one in Ephesians 6 and 4, Paul tells us to bring up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach them what he says. Make sure they do what he says. We need to do that because going to heaven is more important than their score on their SAT or what college they get into or what their little league batting average was. 
and by raising faithful disciples. That's going to have an impact on churches. Churches are blessed when generation after generation there has been cultivated within the kids the heart of a faithful disciple. You know, the truth is, folks, it's a blessing to have older people laboring in the kingdom of God because that's a collection of a lot of experience and wisdom. But the problem is, we are not going to be around forever. And we need to be preparing the next generation to take up the mantle and continue the work. When we don't train our children, everybody loses. So, second thing churches need to do, take care of their kids. Ten minutes? I think I can do this. Last thing. Churches decline because they fight and divide. That's the last thing I want to talk about this morning. Because they fight and divide. This seems to be a common thread that pulls together this tapestry of churches that are in a state of decline, that they have a problem getting along with each other. And in my circle of experience, what I found over the years is that a lot of these struggles are not important struggles. It's not like there was some big battle over a doctrinal controversy that threatened to lead people astray. Some false teacher who'd come in uh, teaching, uh, you know, false doctrine and trying to, 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 to pull away the sheep from the flock, you know. Those aren't the kind of battles I hear about tearing churches apart. More often than not, it's personality battles and judgment kind of stuff. I was having lunch with a preacher one week when we were, I was doing a meeting up where he preached and he shared with me that they'd had this big blow up in the congregation there over, y'all ready for this? Over ceiling fans. Okay, good, y'all don't have any. Ceiling fans. Do you believe that? I just have to tell you, that kind of meaningless squabbling leaves in its wake people who are hostile and bitter toward each other. I'm imagining um, two people on opposite sides of the ceiling fan controversy probably aren't going to team up for a Bible class the next quarter, don't you imagine? And then once you get outside the people who are involved in the controversy, you got all the people who had to witness the controversy and how it leaves them discouraged and cynical. And I will just tell you, the more that kind of stuff goes on, the more you're dealing with some kind of senseless squabbling over a nothing issue over and over again, I tell you folks, it just douses the fires of passion and enthusiasm. Churches can't thrive in that atmosphere. And sometimes it's worse than that because the ceiling fan controversy did not just upset the church and become some point of friction. This church actually split. I wanted to go check out the new building and see if it had ceiling fans. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. They divided. Someone said, oh, there's got to be deeper issues than that. <laughs> yes, I think there probably are. But imagine that. Two churches now or a church now torn apart into two pieces and all the ugliness and bitterness goes. I tell you what you, what you have when all that's over is two churches that don't function anymore. It makes me think what Paul said in Galatians. Will you look there in your Bible in Galatians chapter 5? He gave us this warning in Galatians 5 in verse 13. He said, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But look at 15. He said, but if you divide and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. And that's what happened to this church. It happens to a lot of churches. Think about it. You're not baptizing anybody, so there's no new blood coming in at all. And then you lose 60, 70% of your kids, and then the remnants that le that's left goes to war with each other. I tell you, when you th add those three factors together, it's not hard to figure out why churches don't survive. They can't survive in that kind of climate. So can I talk real plain for a second? Because we need to say it. This kind of stuff is wicked. 
It is contrary to the love that Jesus said we were to have for each other in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give you, verse 34, that you love one another even as I have loved you. It works against his prayer for us in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, when he prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And it impedes if it doesn't completely derail our efforts to fulfill the mission to go preach the gospel to every creature. How can we focus on battling the devil when we are consumed with battling one another? Brothers and sisters, men and women will stand before God and they will answer for this needless distraction imposed on the people of God. This senseless squabbling. It is wicked. So, if that's the problem, what do we do about it? We work really hard to be one. We work really hard to get along with each other. First of all, to do that, we need to recognize that the work of God cannot thrive in an atmosphere of acrimony. And we all need to think about that before we engage a fuss, okay? The church cannot thrive if we're all fighting with each other. And so when I've got an issue, when I'm unhappy about something, the very first question I need to ask myself is, does this matter enough? to distract us from things like reaching lost people and being sure our kids are strong and spreading the gospel? Is this important enough to sidetrack us on this issue? I'm just guessing ceiling fans would not qualify. Are you with me on that? Someone should have gotten over it and moved on. Need to ask that question. Is it worth distracting us? Secondly, we need to work really, really hard on unity. Would you look at Ephesians 4? You know, after describing these amazing things Christ has done for us in the first three chapters of this book, uh, verse 4 transitions to sort of the practical part of the letter. And Paul says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. I, what's interesting is the very first thing he talks about is what we're talking about. So as he begins to apply how we should behave because of what Christ had done for us, he says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Look at verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That language there in verse 3 is interesting. I am not a Greek scholar. I don't pretend to be one on Sundays, no matter what hotel I stayed in, okay? But, um, but those who are scholars tell us that the idea... The idea is that we work on an ongoing basis and we work hard at unity. And so what that says to me is unity is not ever something we figure out. It's not this thing that we get to, we've got it, we put it on the shelf and we don't have to work, worry about it anymore. Unity is something that God's people have to work on chronically all the time. The challenge to get along with each other. If I had some time this morning, I'd sit here and talk about what a bizarre collection of people you are. And that's not you, that's every church family. In some cases, the only thing that unites you and I together is our faith in Jesus Christ. And one of my shepherds back home would want me to say to you, and it is the most important thing that binds us together in Christ. We need to work really hard to be one. As a part of that, we need to be committed to unity. You're going to have problems here. How did I know that? Because this is a church. It's, it's the New Testament pattern. Churches have problems. They do everywhere. We just need to be committed that when they come up along the way, we're not going to pack up and go to a church across town. I'm not going to get mad and quit on the Lord. How, what sense does that make? No, I'm going to hang in there. and We're going to work at it. And we're going to figure it out. And as part of that, I need to develop the qualities it describes in verse 2 that enable us to create unity. Did you see that in verse 2? In order to do what he said in verse 3, we have to be people who are humble with each other and gentle with each other and patient and tolerant. That doesn't mean tolerant of sin. It means sometimes you just got to put up with each other. One translation renders it that way. Put up with each other. I told someone the other day, I said, 
if someone's getting on your nerves in this church and you pack up and go somewhere else, you just wait a year and you're going to find someone else just like that who gets on your nerves. Have you just found just about every place you've been there, someone just rubs you the wrong way or just, just you have trouble getting along with? Every church. The truth is, you got the same problem in your family. There's some people that you hope don't show up for Thanksgiving, right? It's the way family is. We need to anticipate that. And so we learn to bear with each other. We learn to be patient. We learn to be gentle. You know why most churches fuss? Because it's made up of a bunch of spiritual adolescents. Ooh, that was kind of harsh. Sorry about that. But look, they've never grown up. And learn to be humble and gentle and loving and tolerant. The character piece of this is absolutely key. I tell you, folks, there are times to battle. You didn't hear me say different this morning, right? Somebody comes into our church and they start leading some of our folks off into some, some doctrinal error. That's the bell, right? Okay. Lead them off into error. We're going to have a battle. We're going to fight that. But because there are battles that have to be fought, we don't want to fight battles that don't need to be fought. Like over ceiling fans. Because churches that fight with each other have started the clock. And the time is going to come when they're going to decline. Let me just close with this thought. And when we talk about churches declining, we're just talking about something that is profoundly important. The work that God has given us to do together is the most important work on the face of the earth. We want to be extremely effective at that work. We want that work to thrive, not as some kind of source of congregational pride or so we can compare ourselves to other. It is because the work we do is the most important work. May we do what's necessary to be extremely effective. Thank you for your attention this morning.